Okay, tonight we're talking about do we need a temple? And in way of preface to this, uh, I want to uh, say ahead of time, this is not meant as a session of mocking or denigrating the Mormon temple ritual. But since they hold it as uh, a, an absolute requirement for eternal life, I feel it is open to discussion and for Christians to examine it. And there uh, might be a couple of areas that someone of a, a temple holding, uh, recommend holding person might object to, but uh, I'm sorry, but uh, when you say it's about eternal life, then I think we have the right to discuss it. But in that regard, when we get to question and answer time, I would just ask that you be careful on what you ask, that it is not done in a way to make fun of them, but in seeking information, that's fine, but not in a way of ridicule. Okay, tonight, uh, in looking at the topics of temples, we want to compare what it says in the Bible about temples with the LDS teachings. Do we have a slide? Okay, starting off, I want to read a statement that's on the Mormon uh, webpage, mormon.org, and it says, since the time of Solomon, temples have had the same purpose. Notice that word. They've had the same purposes, including bringing people closer to God. Holy temples are as necessary today as they were anciently when they served as sac sacred locations to make covenants, perform holy ordinances, and to be taught by God. Today, in over 140 temples worldwide, Mormons do those same things. Through the power of the priesthood, members are married for time and eternity and perform proxy baptisms for their ancestors who died without enjoying the blessings of these saving ordinances. And notice that it says that at the start there, since the time of Solomon, temples have had the same purposes, including bringing people closer to God. Well, of course, they were to bring you closer to God, but are they the same rituals? And that's what we want to discuss. So we look at the Bible. The forerunner to the temple in Israel was the tabernacle which was first instituted during the 40 years Israel wandered in the wilderness at the time of Moses. The book of Exodus, chapters 26 through 30, records instructions on the furnishings and the building of the tent and the rituals. Hundreds of years later, Solomon built his, his permanent temple following the pattern of the tabernacle. And for that, if you want to read about it further, look at 1 Kings 7 and 2 Chronicles 4. The whole point of the Old Testament sacrificial system was to show that man's sins had separated him from God and that he could only approach God through bringing his offerings to the temple for the priest to present it at the altar. And then once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies to present an offering for both himself and all Israel. All of this served as a forerunner to the ultimate offering for sin when Jesus himself as our great high priest would enter the true Holy of Holies on our behalf and offer himself as the lamb slain for the sins of the world. When we look at the biblical temple and compare it to the LDS temple, we see no common purpose. The sole function of the biblical temple was to teach the need for atonement of sins as a precondition for authentic worship of the true and living God. Solomon expressed this purpose of the temple in 2 Chronicles 2.6. Who am I that I should build him a house, save only to burn sacrifice before him? By contrast, Mormon temples exist as places to perform rituals, such as baptism for the dead and eternal marriage. However, these Mormon temple rituals are not supported by the Bible, ancient Jewish literature, or early Christian history. And as a side note, neither are they supported by the Book of Mormon. And so on the screen, we have an illustration of the uh, temple and how it was laid out. And as you look at that, you see 
at the front of it, the uh, place where they burn the offering. To the side of it is the basin, laver, whatever, sea, whatever you want to, word you use, there's several words used in the Old Testament. And this was on the back of uh, 12 oxen representing 12 tribes of Israel. But this is where the priest washed himself. Then the priests would go inside, and inside you had the uh, showbread and the candelabra and the incense and things. And then there was a curtain, and then you get to the back, and you get to the Holy of Holies that only the high priest could enter, none of which is the layout of the LDS temple. Inside each Mormon temple, there is an impressive baptismal font. And this is the uh, Salt Lake Temple, I believe, showing it uh, with the oxen supporting the baptismal font, which is for baptism for the dead. This font is modeled after a description in the Bible of the large basin, also called Laver or Sea, that was located just outside the door of Solomon's Temple. And you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 4, 2, and then also verse 15. However, the basin at the biblical temple was not used for baptisms, as the Mormon church teaches. Rather, the scriptures plainly state that it was used by the priests to wash themselves after offering animal sacrifices in preparation for ministry in the sanctuary. And you can read about that further in Exodus chapter 30, verses 18 through 20, and 2 Chronicles 4, 2 through 6. The Mormon practice of baptism for the dead is neither a Jewish nor Christian practice, but rather a ritual introduced by Joseph Smith. When trying to establish the need for baptism for the dead, Mormons use 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? This is the only verse in the Bible that mentions baptism for the dead. Notice that Paul is not advocating its practice. He merely makes a passing reference to some group that had such a practice. His emphasis throughout that chapter is on the resurrection. Had baptism for the dead been a primary function of the early church, surely there would have been more teaching on it than this offhand reference. It is also of interest that the Book of Mormon is silent about such a practice. According to the Book of Mormon, there would not be any group of people that would benefit from such a rite. In Mosiah 2, verses 37 through 39, and Alma 34, verses 32 through 35, it is clearly taught that if a person puts off repentance till death, he is sealed to the devil and there is no remedy. Then in Moroni 8, 22 through 23, and 2 Nephi 9, 25 through 26, and Mosiah 15, 24 through 27, we read that those who have died without ever hearing the gospel are saved just like little children. Thus, according to the Book of Mormon, if you had a chance to accept the gospel and rejected it, you are condemned. And if you died never hearing the gospel, you will be saved. This leaves no group of people that need baptism for the dead. Mormons will often say to me that the New Testament was changed and the teaching about temples and baptism for the dead and eternal marriage were taken out. Uh, they just assert that. There is no manuscript evidence to show that those things were taken out. But what is the answer for the Book of Mormon? No one would have tampered with that to take it out. There wasn't any Catholic church in America that was uh, wickedly changing Nephi's record. And yet the Book of Mormon is silent on all these kind of rituals as well. And yet at the front of the Book of Mormon in the introduction, it says that the angel told Joseph Smith that the Book of Mormon contained the fullness of the everlasting gospel. It doesn't say foundation, it says fullness. And so the Book of Mormon itself is silent on these major doctrines of Mormonism. And surely if we all need temple work done for us to have eternal life, exaltation, why wouldn't it be mentioned in the Book of Mormon? Well, from an unbeliever outside position, I would say that it's because Joseph Smith hadn't thought of it yet. When he started his church, it reflected his Protestant upbringing 
and as the years went by, he moved further and further away from his biblical studies as a teenager reading the Bible and went off in his own direction to come up with new doctrines, which is one of the problems with the Book of Mormon is that it undercuts the authority of the Bible and uh, Mormons will leave Mormonism and not even think to go back to look at the Bible again because they're so trained in this idea that the Bible's corrupt and you can't trust it. And yet they don't even trust the Book of Mormon because when I point out to them that it doesn't teach their doctrine, they say, oh, well, that was just the foundation. And I have to point out to them, it didn't say foundation. The angel said that it was uh, the fullness. And if I got a full glass of water, you aren't putting more water in it. And if the Book of Mormon is the fullness, you aren't putting more teachings in it. <laughs> And that was an issue for Gerald and I when we were struggling with Mormonism, that we could see the Book of Mormon didn't teach temple ritual or work for the dead or their ironic Melchizedek priesthood concepts or many other things like uh, three levels of heaven, uh, work for the dead, uh, pre-existence, uh, none of those things were in the Book of Mormon. And so it confused us, it took us a while to work through all that. Anyways, next we want to think about celestial marriage. Likewise, the Mormon temple rite of eternal marriage was never practiced in the biblical temple. Such a ritual is nowhere to be found in ancient Jewish literature or early Christian history. To the contrary, in Romans 7, 2, the Apostle Paul clearly teaches that marriage is only for mortal life. Quote, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. Now, you would have thought if Paul believed in celestial marriage, that he, this would have been a good time to put something in here to explain, well, uh, you can remarry again, but uh, you're still sealed to the first guy. And so when you get to heaven, you'll have the first husband, even if you marry someone else along the line. But he doesn't put any instruction in for this. Or if a um, uh, man outlives his wife, there's nothing here about that. Uh, uh, well, you're still sealed to that first wife, but you can go ahead and marry more women in the temple and have more wives in heaven. See, Paul had the opportunity here to instruct people on these points if they were part of the church. And yet the record is silent. Likewise, Jesus taught us that in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven, Matthew twenty-two thirty. 30. Again, if Jesus believed in the importance of being sealed as an eternal couple, why would he leave us with this thought and not explain further? Now, when I bring this up to Mormons, they will often say to me, well, those Sadducees hadn't had a temple marriage, so of course the woman won't belong to any of those men that have been proposed to him <laughs> because they, they didn't have a temple ritual. I said, well, yeah, but he didn't say that. He didn't explain this. If these were really doctrines, why wouldn't they have been in the record? Again, this ritual of eternal marriage is not biblical. As we look at the... Um, different points of Mormon rituals and the Bible, we see that many rules of the Bible have been violated in the way they put together their uh, rituals and concepts. And I want to give you four examples. Number one, God appointed only one temple to reflect the fact that there is only one true God. Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 6. One temple, one God. Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 6 says, But you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. There bring your burnt offerings and sacrifice. Notice the start of that. You are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. God was going to show them where the temple went, and there was to be one temple. In contrast, the Mormon church operates scores of temples in violation of the one temple we see in the Old Testament. Number two, all activities in the biblical temple were public knowledge. 
They were spelled out in detail in scripture. For example, see Exodus chapters 26 through 30 and in the book of Leviticus. One of the problems I find with Mormons in talking about the temple ritual is uh, it's, they always say, tell me it's too sacred to talk about. And I said, well, it wasn't too sacred to talk about in the Old Testament. All the Israelites knew what happened in the temple. There was no big secret. It was restricted on the priesthood access to the building, but there was no secret about what happened in there. And there was no restriction on people talking about what happened in there. Number three, the Bible warns that Christians, uh, warns them against participating in secret activities. Now, I know the Mormons want to say it's not secret, it's sacred. But if you cannot talk to me about it, or anyone else for that matter, it's secret. Our communion service, I consider to be a sacred experience. But there's nothing in it I couldn't discuss with anyone. It's something you could be, uh, we would be thrilled to have you come and sit through <laughs> our uh, communion service. We just ask that uh, only those that haven't come to faith in Christ restrain themselves from partaking um, because it's a covenant between us and God so that uh, you could watch it. We can discuss it. It is not secret, yet it is sacred. So I don't understand the idea that the Mormon ritual is so sacred that they can't discuss it. If it wasn't that sacred in the Old Testament, and all the people there could discuss it and know what happened. Jesus affirmed in John 18, 20, I spake openly to the world in secret, I have said nothing. And in Ephesians 5, 11 through 13, Paul admonishes us, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Now someone might object to say that things done in the Mormon temple um, are not shameful. Uh, I would say there are things in there that have been done in the past that are shameful. They have since made changes in it to where you don't have as much of that as it used to be there. But the very fact that it denigrates the atonement of Christ by saying that his atonement is not sufficient is denigrating Christ, and I find that to be shameful. In sharp contrast, the Mormon church insists on keeping temple rituals secret, and you swear an oath to not reveal anything that goes on in the temple. That, to me, makes it secret. Number four, the Bible sets forth strict lineage requirements for the Aaronic priesthood. It teaches very explicitly that only men from the tribe of Levi and the family line of Aaron were qualified to serve as priests in the temple sanctuary. And you can read about that in Numbers 3.10, Exodus 29.9, and Numbers 18.1 through 7. I want to talk a minute about the clothing for the high priest and the priest. The clothing for the high priest and the other priest was laid out in Exodus 39. This is very different from the LDS temple clothing with their green apron representing Adam and Eve's effort to cover their sin of disobedience. And when you read about it in the Old Testament, you see that he has on a white tunic over which comes this blue robe and then this uh, frontal piece in front and back uh, that has the uh, square thing on the front with all the jewels and the 12 tribes of Israel on it. Uh, the priests that served under the high priest had a white tunic thing that they wore with a sash. And I guess Mormons could kind of stretch it and say, well, the, the regular priests kind of look like the temple guys in a Mormon temple as far as that goes dressed in white. Uh, but they don't leave it there. They put more on them than just the white tunic. Now, on the LDS webpage, they have now put up an illustration, a photo of the temple clothing that goes over the white outfit that they wear. And since they have now put up photos of the hat, the robe, the green apron, although it's kind of hid in the background, and the sash, I assume that it's fair game to talk about it. So, 
Here is uh, a friend of mine in England dressed in the Mormon temple clothing and myself. <laughs> I didn't intend to have a picture of me taken in this, but I was at a church speaking and they asked me to show them the temple clothing and somebody took a photo and put it on the internet. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, okay, so, since it's out there already, I'll go ahead and show you. Uh, it was, I did not set out to do that, but that's where it ended up. Okay, so that's the clothing that the uh, Mormon is going to wear. Now remember, that's exactly what they're showing in the picture there the green apron, the long sheet, the hat, and the sash. Uh, it's just that it's hard to tell how it would look on you when it's all just laid out flat. So you have on a white shirt and pants or a white dress, and then you have this robe that goes over it and this green apron and the little veil for the woman and the baker's hat for a man. This is very different from the LDS temple clothing, the high priest temple clothing is very different than the LDS temple clothing. The Mormon church also claims to have restored the Aaronic priesthood, but only priests from the line of Aaron were allowed to enter the te biblical temple. Worshippers, even the king of Israel, could not enter to the temple and present at the altar the burnt offering. Since non-priests are allowed to enter and participate in Mormon temple activities, this is another point at which the Mormon temple practices violates the biblical revelation. Besides these points, we find that the Old Testament temple has been made obsolete by the atonement of Christ. At the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus predicted that the Jerusalem temple was about to be destroyed in Matthew 24, 2. He told his disciples, Verily I say to you, there shall not be left one stone upon another. And this was fulfilled in AD 70 when the Romans demolished the temple and it has never been rebuilt. Elsewhere, Jesus said that temple worship was about to be replaced by a new form of worship without a temple building. When talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus said, this is John 4, 21 through 24, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. So here Jesus is telling us that things are going to shift. They're going to go from us going to a temple, to a building, to a point where in spirit we come and meet with God. And we go on to be the temple of God. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Another problem is the veil. A dramatic event happened at the time of Christ's death on the cross, singling the end of temple worship. The Gospels record that at the very moment Jesus died, quote, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And uh, that's recorded in all three Gospels. You can see that in Matthew 27, 51. Before Jesus' death, the thick temple veil had served as a barrier to prevent the priests from entering the Holy of Holies. This inner sanctum represented the place of God's holy and glorious presence. Only the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. In the book of Hebrews 9, uh, chapter 9, verses 6 through 12, we read that when the high priest went into the holy place once a year to make an offering for the people, that this was a type of Christ who would be our great high priest, who by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This restriction signified that the access unto God's presence was not truly provided by the Old Covenant. In the words of the New Testament book of Hebrews 9, verses 7 through 8, but only the high priest entered the inner room 
and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, the, the people I committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. Now, through faith in Christ, believers are granted free access into the very presence of God. In the words of the New Testament book of Hebrews, seeing then that we have a great high priest that passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and, keep, and find grace to help in time of need. That's Hebrews 4. 14 through 16. The rending of the veil signified the end of temple worship. That system is now obsolete, and we no longer need a human priest or temple. Under the new covenant established by Jesus Christ, he is the believer's high priest in the very sanctuary of heaven itself. Thus, a Christian temple, such as the Mormon church proposes, it is a contradiction in terms. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6.16 6, that we are the temple of the living God. And in Ephesians 2.19-22, 20 Paul writes that we are the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We are built together as God's holy temple. Now I'd like to shift and talk a little about the actual Mormon rituals and uh, how they came to be. There are four different uh, rituals performed in a Mormon temple. The first one we've already talked about, baptism for the dead, that's done in the font in the basement of the temple. Well, the font's in the basement. You stand on the first floor to look at it. Uh, then they have the endowment ceremony. Uh, and this is when a missionary goes on his mission or a couple are getting married, they go through what they term the endowment, and this is when they start wearing the special Mormon undergarments. Um, so all the missionaries you see going out door to door, they've all been through what they term the endowment, and the word endowment is to be endowed with knowledge and power. So you go to the temple to be endowed with all that you need to know to get back to Heavenly Father. And the endowment ceremony starts off with the washing and anointing ceremony. This has changed drastically through the years. When Joseph Smith started the temple ritual, this was a full bath and anointing with oil, women with women, men with men. Over the years, this has been uh, modified uh, so that by 1900 in the Salt Lake Temple, they had a bathtub that you stood in but you were just ceremonially poured over water and then with oil put on you. Uh, but it wasn't a full bathtub immersion. <laughs> um, and now they have continued to modify this so that today when a person goes into the temple, um, it's very different than what you would have seen even 20 years ago uh, or even 15 years ago. They, it used to be that you took off all your clothes and put them in a locker room and you had a sheet over you and then you went into the washing and anointing room and two people of the same sex as you would ceremonially anoint your body by touching your, their fingers in water and touching the sides of your body. And then they would do it with oil and touch the sides of your body. You would, you'd had this sheet on that was open at the sides, kind of like getting an x-ray or something and they would reach under there and touch to the side of your body, as they said, prayer blessings over you. But that evidently became offensive to a lot of people, and uh, they closed it up, and they tried a little more modified version until finally, a few years ago, they scrapped the whole idea of the um, outer garment, uh, the, this shield, they called it, um, to have on. Now they just start you right off with putting your... Uh, Mormon garments on in your locker room, putting on your white outfit, and then going into the room for the washing and anointing. So it's no longer really washing and anointing. I mean, there was a reason it used to be called washing and anointing, and that's been reduced now to simply a dab of water on your forehead and a dab of oil on your forehead, as they say, the prayer blessings over you. 
uh, at that point, you go back to your locker room and you have a little envelope with clothing you're going to put on later as you go in for the rest of the endowment ceremony. And this is where you will see a movie depicting the creation story. And during this, they uh, will instruct you on certain handshakes and passwords. I'm not going to go into all those. Uh, things that you have to learn in order to pass the final test at the end of the ceremony where you have to get back to uh, the attendant, uh, the things you learned that day on the handshakes and passwords. And when you get up to this part of the ceremony, you're in a uh, auditorium looking room. And this is what I saw on Thursday. And they, had, uh, they explained that the women sat on one side, the men on the other. And I was surprised that our guide was fairly forthcoming in a lot of the things he described about this. And uh, he even pulled back the curtain at the front of the room to show us that behind this was the veil that you would have to pass through to go through the door into the celestial kingdom. Now, he didn't show us the whole veil. He just pulled the curtain back to show us that's where the veil was <laughs> and showed us where the door was into the celestial kingdom. This is all symbolic of what a person has to do to get back to God. In the time of coming up to the veil, they have a person standing on the other side that represents God, and you will, uh, it, God will reach through his hand, and you will have to give to this man the handshakes and passwords you learned that day in order for you to pass, symbolically pass into the celestial kingdom, into the other room. At this point, if you were going to make up a, a ceremony to help young Christians understand what Christ did for you on the cross to secure for you eternal life, and you were to make up a story about man's journey from the Garden of Eden to the Judgment Day, what would you have the person say when they stood before God? I would think you would say something about uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. <laughs> Something where you would appeal to Christ's atonement for your sin, that you are not worthy, but you claim Christ's righteousness to enter in. Something along those lines. But what the Mormon says is a little phrase, and I'm, I won't say it here on the film. It gets everybody too shook. Uh, but it has nothing to do with Christ. The statement is all about uh, God giving me power in my own life to go through eternal procreation. It's all me-centered. It is not centered on the atonement of Christ. Then when you get into the uh, celestial room, uh, at that point, if you were a missionary, that would be the end of your day. You don't do the last ceremony they do, well, not the last, but the next ceremony, the eternal marriage covenant, you don't do till later when you come home from your mission and you get married. Uh, you don't have to go back and go through this first part, the washing and anointing and endowment ceremony, unless you want to. You can just skip those and just meet your bride or bridegroom at the temple for the actual marriage ceremony. And that is done in a little side room, and they showed us their different little rooms where they do the temple ritual uh, for, the endowment ceremony, uh, for the marriage ceremony. Uh, in these rooms are, depending on the size of the room, uh, a number of chairs for whatever number of your family or friends can, number one, qualify to come in to see you get married because they have to have a temple ritual, uh, recommend, and uh, they have to be at least 18 unless it's a family being sealed for all eternity. Generally, it's going to be people 18 or older. And um, at this point, the bride and groom will be dressed in their temple clothing. So when you see a picture of a Mormon wedding picture on a mantle, that is not what the couple looked like at the moment they were married. They looked like that picture. Okay. That's what they looked like. They were dressed in a white outfit with a green apron and this funny hat. Now, the girl could have on her wedding dress but it would be covered by this sheet that goes over the front and back and ties at the side and this green apron with a sash and a little veil that's a temple veil. You cannot wear the veil your folks bought you for your reception. It's a temple veil you have to wear. And your groom will be dressed all in white and will have an outfit on just like this man in the picture. 
Now, when they get through with their marriage, they go out, they go back to their locker room and change into the clothes they're going to wear to the reception, and then they come out and have their picture taken in front of the temple, and it all looks like this beautiful, wonderful celebration, and you think that's what they looked like when they got married. No, they looked like the pictures here. So the ladies and men that you see on missions have not had the eternal marriage yet. They've just had the endowment part. Uh, later, hopefully, according to the Mormons, they will go and do the eternal marriage. But there is another ritual that they don't talk about very often, and that's called the second anointing. And this is a private ceremony between a man and a woman, and you have to be invited to this by someone in the first presidency. This is something that you do not apply for. The leaders of the church have to invite you to come and have your second anointing. Most Mormons will not know about this ceremony, but it's written in a number of books. It was in journals uh, back before the turn of the century. All historians on Mormon temple ritual or on early Mormonism are aware of second anointing. It's just the populace that aren't because the church doesn't talk about it. In the second anointing ritual, they will be dressed in their temple clothing again. They, the man and wife will have a foot washing ceremony and then they will be a, have a part of the ceremony that the man and wife will complete once they get home. But the officiator conducting this is sealing on their head absolute eternal life. They have now have a guarantee of exaltation short of murder. At that point, it won't matter what sin you ever commit short of murder and you are guaranteed to have godhood. Uh, this used to be done quite a bit uh, in the old days, but in today's world, the Mormons have got a little more uh, selective on who they give this to. It's usually something that's given to you after years of service, maybe after you're middle-aged and have proved yourself uh, through some extensive service like mission president or something that way that shows that you're gonna stay Mormon no matter what happens. And then they might invite you to a second anointing ceremony. They also hold other kind of meetings in the temple. The apostles meet there uh, once a week uh, in a special room to conduct business. They sometimes have a special assembly meeting there where they'll have certain leaders come in for special instruction or sermons. But the four elements of ceremonies are baptism for the dead, an endowment ceremony, eternal marriage, and second anointing. Okay, now I want to give you a little rundown on how this all came to be because it didn't all happen just overnight. It wasn't there at the beginning of Mormonism. The Mormon temple ritual has a lot of elements in it that are taken from masonry. And in fact, if you looked at the Mormon temple underwear, which they also have a picture of that on the internet, on the Mormon website, but uh, it's not a close-up, so you can't really tell all the details on it. But on the, both the men and the women's breast area of the temple garment is a little, looks like a little L and a V embroidery stitch, and that stands for the compass and square of masonry. In the early years before Joseph even started, uh, there was an anti-Masonic fervor uh, because in 1826, a guy by the name of William Morgan did an expose of the Masonic ritual and was murdered. And I think we see reflected in the Book of Mormon um, a disgust of the Masonic secret rituals. The Book of Mormon talks against secret groups, oaths, and uh, the Gadianton robbers, if you have familiarity with the Book of Mormon, are the bad guys that uh, swear on an oath to protect one another, right or wrong. Uh, and those are elements at the very beginning of Mormonism. So it looks like at the start they were... Um, opposed to Masonic things, but as the years go by, uh, things change. You know, Joseph's father and brother were Masons at the time he started Mormonism, and I think that there had been enough uh, influence of Masonry in the home that he already had some thoughts about it, but they were negative thoughts at that point. In the uh, early 1830s, Joseph Smith started working on the Book of Moses, and in it, in chapter 5, you'll find references to Cain as being Master Mahan, and I think this is a throwback to Masonry, uh, talking about secret combinations. 
Anyways, then moving up to 1836, when supposedly Joseph Smith has uh, this um, ordinance of, of sealing for eternal life, when they have the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, they do foot washing and uh, anointing of one another. And at this time, he's having these ceremonies of sealing people to eternal life. This is not a marriage contract. This is men in the priesthood meetings who go through these uh, ceremonies of washing and, and anointing for sealing up to eternal life. Mormons go back and read their old history. They encounter the word sealing for eternal life and they assume that there was knowledge there on the temple ritual that was not there. The sealing in 38 had nothing to do with marriage. Then in 1840, you get the uh, revelation on baptism for the dead. Uh, Joseph's brother, Alvin, had died without baptism years before Mormonism started, and the family was all worried about what happened to Alvin. And I think this prompted Joseph Smith to come up with the idea of baptism for the dead so that Alvin could have salvation. So it gets introduced in the early 1840s. But it's not part of a temple ritual yet. It's just a thing on its own. Then um, this goes on in 41 when he starts uh, talking about the need for a specific font for doing these ceremonies. And he starts to develop the idea of a temple ritual. Um, then we know that Joseph Smith starts taking plural wives. Well, now the question is whether he took some in the 1830s. But at least by 1841, everyone's agreed he was at least by then taking plural wives. And he is sealed to these different women. But these sealings are not temple rituals. These are just sealings for the marriage. Like Louisa Beeman, the first uh, plural wife in Nauvoo, he meets her out at the river and they have some guy do a secret ceremony where they're sealed together. But again, this isn't part of a temple ritual. He hasn't put all this together. These are pieces of things that uh, come together later on. Joseph goes on to get some of his friends to come into polygamy. Uh, but he's not sealed to Emma in an eternal marriage sealing until 1843, by which time he already had probably a couple of dozen wives. But again, this wasn't part of a temple ritual. Um, in 1842, Joseph Smith joins the Masons, and he goes, uh, rises up the three degrees to become a master Mason. And that's when he sees all of these handshakes, rituals, symbolism that we see become incorporated into the Mormon temple ritual. And it's only a short while after he becomes a Mason that he comes up with this temple ritual. Now, uh, many of the Mormons in Nauvoo had joined masonry, so when he comes up with this temple ritual and they go through it, of course they recognize that a lot of the elements came from the masonry they had just gone through a few months before. So, how do you explain the similarities? And the Mormon answer was that the masons had gone into an apostasy, just like the Christian church, and that God was restoring true masonry in Joseph's temple ritual. So what they had experienced as Masons was just a forerunner of the true, just like Christian baptism was a forerunner to true baptism. Interesting, though, on the start of the endowment ceremony, which he starts in 1842, it was for men. It had nothing to do with marriage. The first endowment ceremonies were just for men. And they were, again, being washed and anointed as potential kings and priests, but this is not with women. There's no women in these meetings. You don't get the uh, marriage ceiling uh, ideas coming up until 1843. And you see the pulling together of the temple ritual being a marriage ritual. And this comes together in section 132 in 1843 when uh, he lays out his whole argument for polygamy. So that temple ritual, I see, was really the way for Joseph to set up a community that was bound on secret oaths to never tell anything against another brother 
that he could then introduce these men into his polygamy circles because they had all taken oaths in these earlier men-only meetings where they had sworn an oath to one another so they could be trusted now. And then he comes up with his uh, temple ritual and the uh, temple marriage ceiling to where the women are brought into the rituals as well. Uh, in July, uh, Joseph's brother Hiram finally becomes converted to the idea of polygamy, but Emma, Joseph's wife, will not accept it. And Hiram says, well, if you'll write it down, I'll take it to Emma and I can convince her of this. And Joseph is recorded as saying, you don't know Emma as well as I do. <laughs> and that proved true, because uh, even according to Mormon historians, when uh, he went and read it to her, uh, Emma would have nothing to do with it. And then in August of 43, Section 132 is read to the Nauvoo High Council. And uh, originally, the um, temple endowment ceremony include, was really a polygamous marriage situation. These were all men taking plural wives that they are being sealed to eternally. Uh, in September, he comes up with his idea of second anointings, which at that time, everybody was getting second anointed. Uh, to be kings and priests and queens and priestesses, and this was for the couples to become gods. Uh, and the second anointing ceremony where they do the foot washing and the woman washes her husband's feet is taken from the idea of Mary Magdalene washing Jesus' feet because in early Mormonism, she was a plural wife of Joseph. And so her washing his feet was a wife's act to her husband, and so the foot washing and the second anointing of the woman washing her husband's feet is part of polygamy. Uh, polygamy is still a part of Mormonism today. It was interesting when we went through the temple on Thursday. Uh, I asked the guide, I said, well, uh, I understand your new prophet, uh, who's Nelson, and he's 93, but he's outlived his first wife and married his second wife. And I said, I understand. I saw in the Deseret News where it announced he was the new prophet that it said, uh, told about his wife and that she was his second wife. So does this mean that he will be a polygamist in heaven? And the guy said, oh, of course. We aren't ashamed of polygamy, yes. Uh, for those that have had more than one ceiling, yes, they will have their mates in the hereafter. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> and I thought, well, you don't say that on the radio. <laughs> uh, because I talk to a lot of Mormons that are sure polygamy is dead and gone. But then you have a lot of Mormon women who are very concerned about polygamy. Consequently, there's a book out right now. I think it's titled um, Ghost of Polygamy Past. I think that's the way the title goes. Uh, and it's all about women's current fears of being stuck in a polygamous marriage if uh, they die first and their husband marries another woman in the temple. So it's a very current doctrine. It's something they intend to live in the hereafter. Changes that have come in through the years, in recent years through my lifetime in the Mormon temple ritual uh, have been the um, uh, gradual changing on the way the washing anointing was done. Changes in the Mormon temple undergarment went from one piece long and baggy to a shorter version um, to the knees and to the elbows, and then it kept getting shorter, and then finally it went to two piece. Uh, and now they keep coming out with new kinds of material, so that it's, they're trying to make it more comfortable and easy to wear. But if God gave the temple garment to Joseph Smith, why can they change it? When, when we look at how uh, insistent they are on a sacrament prayer being done word perfect, and I've sat in sacrament meetings where a young kid, has, a 16-year-old boy, has had to say the sacrament prayer six times to get it word perfect. In a baptismal service, if the girl's hair is not, if top of the head is not totally wet, they will do it over again. They are so exacting on these things, and yet when it comes to things in the temple ritual, they can keep changing it. And I don't understand how they can change temple rituals, but they can't change these other things. Okay, so they uh, have reduced the garment, uh, made it more comfortable. They've changed things uh, 
in the actual wording of the temple. And up until 1978, blacks could not go to the temple. It wasn't just a matter of not giving priesthood to blacks. It's that a black woman couldn't go to a temple either. I mean, they had no temple ritual. So a Mormon will point to Elijah Abel, a black man who held the priesthood in Joseph Smith and Brigham Young's day, but he didn't get to go to the temple. And they don't mention that part. He still was excluded from there. And that didn't change until 1978. Changes they made in 1990, uh, there used to be in the play that they did with Adam and Eve in the fall, uh, the devil would send out a minister in clerical garb to try to convince Adam and Eve to follow the Christian idea of uh, God without body parts or passion, everywhere present, but yet he could dwell in your heart, and they ridiculed this. Uh, the devil would pay the minister for teaching these false doctrine. Well, they've now taken the minister out. He's not there anymore. They used to embrace on the five points of fellowship, which was very clearly a Masonic uh, situation. And if you look up on the internet, just type in five points of fellowship, it'll pull up an illustration from the Freemasons on this. It might pull up one on the Mormons. I don't know, but I know it will pull up on the Masons. And five points of fellowship where the inside of the foot, the inside of the knee, uh, as you stand with someone facing someone, uh, you put the right foot inside between their two legs to where your knee is against their knee, hand to back, mouth to ear, and you're going to shake hands with that person to give them the handshakes you learned in the temple that day. This was done at the veil before you entered into the celestial kingdom. It was the highlight of the ceremony. It was the final test. This is when you said into God's ear the magic phrase that gets you through the door. People were uncomfortable with this embrace, and so it was dropped in 1990. And they just went up to the veil and said the phrase into God's ear, but there was no embrace, the handshake, but no embrace. There used to be penalties in the temple ritual that have been removed. And it used to be taken from the masons where you drew your thumb across your throat, symbolic of... Uh, the way in which life could be taken, and that was the temple oath of having your throat slit if you revealed the ceremony. But this is a Masonic symbol. And the uh, pulling the thumb across the heart and across the bowels, that's all Masonic. Well, they took those out in 1990. Then in 2005, they changed the washing and anointing to where the garment uh, was already worn under the shield and it was closed on the side, you weren't just naked. Uh, then around 2014 or 15, I don't remember those exact year, uh, they changed it where you were fully clothed for the uh, washing and anointing where they just touched your forehead. Again, if you have to do everything perfectly, uh, why can the temple ritual and the temple clothing be continually changed? Okay. I want to quote from Brigham Young. Brigham Young, on the occasion of the laying of the cornerstone of the Salt Lake Temple, described the importance of the endowment as the key to entrance into the highest degree of heaven. And this is from the Journal of Discourses, volume 2, page 315. Your endowment is to receive all those ordinances in the house of the Lord which are necessary for you after you have departed this life to enable you to walk back to the presence of the Father passing the angels who stand as sentinels, being enabled to give them the key words, the signs and tokens pertaining to the holy priesthood and gain your eternal exaltation in spite of earth and hell. So it's the temple ritual that gets you back into the presence of God. You've got to be able to give all these handshakes and passwords. However, for the Christian... We look to Hebrews 12, 2, where the Christian's hope is found in looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. When Christ died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And the joy of the Christian is knowing that it is not up to me. It is not whether I can remember some special words or whether I can remember some special signals or handshakes. 
All I have to do is plead the blood of Jesus. That is my entrance into eternal life, into the presence of God. Thank you. I gotta sit down. I can't get on these stools. I'm not good at bar stools. <laughs> I haven't had enough practice. <laughs> Be okay then? Yeah. We can move the podium and just have you sit alone and come to the chair. Oh, uh, no, I'm up here now. <laughs> All right. Be careful with your question, you might knock her out of her seat. Uh, well, yeah. All right, as usual, we have question and answer. So, go ahead. Uh, Sandra, what is the, um, Sandra, what is the reference for uh, fullness of gospel? Did you have a book along with fullness? Oh, the fullness of gospel? Um, I think it's on the sheets over there on the table is one on um, contradictions in LDS scriptures. And if you go to our website at utlm.org and just type in uh, contradictions, LDS scriptures, it'll pull up a whole list and, and those will be listed there as well. When the LDS dedicated to temple, what's the symbolic meaning of Presidency wear the white suits? Well, that they wear white every time they go in the temple. Everyone's dressed in white. So they, it, the temple workers are all in white. Now, the ones walking around in the hallway when you go through the temple ritual won't have on the green apron usually. They're just in the white outfit. So it's just their standard temple apparel. Uh, one of the things they do at a temple dedication that I went to, I went to the dedication of the Los Angeles temple. And uh, of course, I was a teenager and I knew nothing about the temple ritual. But uh, I was told to bring a clean hanky and I didn't know what that was about. And so they have all this um, conference kind of sounding stuff where all the prophets are talking and we're sitting in one of the rooms in the temple and it's all coming over the microphone. Because I, I wasn't VIP, so I wasn't in the room with the prophet, I was in the side room. Uh, and at a certain point, we all stood up and we were going to do the Hosanna shout. And we all stood up, and as I recall, we were facing east. And uh, so you, <laughs> where's, where's my hanky here? So you have this ritual where you, the Hosanna shout is, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, and then there's some other phrase uh, to, to God Almighty, whatever it is. That, anyways, they got this three thing with the hanky, Hosanna shout, and I'm like, what the heck is this, you know? Uh, I don't think I would have been a good candidate for the temple ritual because that in itself freaked me out. And uh, so the next Sunday at the ward house, I happened to see the bishop in between uh, sacrament service in Sunday school, and I grabbed him and took him aside. I said, hey, Bishop, what's the deal with the wave of the hanky thing with the Hosanna shout? Oh, my word, you'd have thought I was swearing. Uh, he was just appalled, and he says, Sandra, we never talk about those things outside of the temple. Everything that's said in the temple is sacred, and we do not talk about it. Don't ever mention that again, you know? And I'm like, okay, you know, it's just a hanky. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so, anyways. <laughs> so, Sandra, you talked a little bit about baptism for the dead earlier. And one of the scriptures that women sometimes use in connection with baptism for the dead is in the first letter of Peter chapter 3. And beginning in verse 18, it says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And then in verse 19, it goes on and it says, By which also he went to preach unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was prepared, where in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. And so, my question to you is what are your thoughts about 
that structure, and in particular, what are your thoughts in relation to baptism for the dead and work for the dead, things of that nature? That has nothing to do with baptism for the dead. And if we're going to say that it does, it would only be applying to the people at the time of Noah. Because there's no instruction there for anyone to do this any other time, or that it was done for any other people. But I see it as through the same spirit that God warned at the time of Noah, that same spirit speaks to us today and warns us as well. I don't see that as having any reference to work for the dead. That doesn't do it. <laughs> Aaron, did you have? Hmm? If, did you want to follow up on that? Well, I want to follow up on the question. Yeah. Uh, the Kirtland Temple, can you talk more about why that was made, what they were initially doing in there? I know there's, there's reports of staying up late, maybe, or, or uh, wine and uh, pretty charismatic Pentecostal <laughs> right. kind of going on. When you are going to be a charismatic leader of a new movement, you have to keep upping the ante to keep people excited about the movement. And so we see as Mormonism comes along, he's always promising something new, some new deal, some new revelation. I just bought some papyri and oh, lo and behold, it's Abraham, you know, right here, and uh, so it's a wow factor. You always have to have another wow factor. So the temple ritual comes along, at the Kirtland Temple, comes along at a time when you got the failure of the Kirtland Bank, a lot of disfaction in Kirtland. We're going to have the endowment at the temple for the new Kirtland Temple. Got to get this built so we can have this endowment. And he uses the word endowment, but it's not endowment in the sense that it's used later. Mormons read a meaning back into that. The endowment at that time was going to be the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And this was going to be a Pentecostal experience. And they would have looked just like Pentecostal churches of today. Uh, well, I don't know how many Pentecostal churches have that exciting of meetings anymore. But, uh, but that's, this is the, the enthusiasm that's going to be expected for this meeting. You tell everyone to fast for a whole day before you come to the temple. And then you tell everyone you're going to have communion, well, it's sacrament. In those days, they used real wine. And so you fasted all day, and now you're going to have communion, and you can drink all the wine you want because it has been sanctified. And so it'll do you no harm. And so I see them all getting drunk, and they stand up and start prophesying, speaking in tongues. There was a lot of speaking in tongues in early Mormonism. And they all get up and speak in tongues, Brigham Young spoke in tongues. I think uh, Joseph Smith did, but all the main leaders spoke in tongues. So this was the endowment, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then they were also told that this sealed them up to eternal life. But it had nothing to do with the way the words were later used in Mormonism. It, had, it was its own ceremony. And he, he, so, but you have all the problems in Kirtland, you've got to come up with something else. And so when he gets to Nauvoo, He's in trouble over polygamy and all these different things. And so we got a fuller endowment now. We got a bigger ceremony for you to go through. And so he just keeps building. And historians looking at the evolution of Mormon ritual all agree that this is a building process of adding more ideas to the formula until it gets to the complication we get uh, at the end. Um, when Joseph Smith dies, the ceremony has not been written down. And they get out here to Utah, and Brigham Young and the different leaders that went through the ritual in Nauvoo are now trying to figure out the ceremony so they can do it out here, and they get together and try to reconstruct the temple ritual. So the question is, do we have everything right? Who knows? But it's the way Brigham and the brethren put it all back together. As part of what Brigham did, he added in an oath of vengeance, which was against those that killed the prophet Joseph and Hiram. The oath of vengeance was in until 1904, or somewhere around that time period, um, that they swore an oath of a, that if they ever came across anyone that helped to kill the prophets, that they would kill them. And this is what led up to the Mount Metal Massacre, because 
Apostle Pratt had been killed in Arkansas, and now the Mormons felt there was another prophet to be avenged in the oath they took. And when the wagon train from Arkansas came through here, they saw them as guilty as Pratt's murder. Uh, and that was one of their justifications for attacking the wagon train. So this oath has ramifications that are horrible as it comes along. But in the Reed Smoot hearings after the turn of the century, when Reed Smoot was senator from Utah, Mormon apostle, and there was a contention over whether a Mormon should be seated because they didn't keep the laws, obviously, with polygamy and all that. And in the hearings, it was brought up about the oath of vengeance. And at that time, the Mormon church, of course, they denied it, but that's when they took it out. <laughs> uh, so there was another change that happened in uh, the whole temple ritual. It's gone through change after change. So 1836 endowment wasn't 1844 endowment, which wasn't or isn't our endowment as the Mormon would go through today. It's kept evolving. Oh, at the green apron, in the temple ritual, uh, at the very beginning, uh, they, um, well, in most temples you watch a movie, in the Salt Lake Temple, it's, uh, I think it's still live, where you have people play the part of Eve and Adam, you have three men that play the part of Elohim, Heavenly Father, Jehovah, Jesus, and Michael, who will become Adam, and they, they reenact the creation of the world and the fall, and they have this man playing the part of the devil who comes out to tempt Adam and Eve, and in the old version, they, he also had with him a minister that he promised to pay well if he'd teach false doctrine. But now it's just the, the devil that comes out to try to convince Adam and Eve to not follow God. And when Eve takes of the fruit and falls, she puts on, uh, she and Adam put on the green apron which comes out of Genesis. Uh, Adam and Eve made their own covering when they realized they were naked. This is not a positive thing in Genesis that <laughs> when Adam and Eve make the fig leaf apron, this is a covering for their sin, which God rejects and gives them animal skin covering, symbolic of the atonement for their sin is going to be through blood, a forerunner to the atonement of Christ. A picture of that. The odd thing about the apron is that I've talked to Mormons after they've left Mormonism and they have not necessarily made the connection that the green apron would have been bad <laughs> and that it represents Adam and Eve's disobedience to God. And the curious thing that a Mormon wears the green apron when they're married and they have the green apron on when they're buried. To come forth in the day of the resurrection wearing that green apron, man's effort to cover his own sin. And I would say symbolically this covers the whole problem of Mormon doctrine, that it is man's effort to cover his own sin instead of availing themselves of the covering that God supplied through the death of Christ. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, Vance. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Um, William Law talked about Joseph Smith taking women who had arrived in Hollywood into rooms of a Mark Prime. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they had some portion of a house or a building that was for doing the endowment for the temple of God. Yeah, it was uh, Joseph Smith's store, yeah, down by the river. And his, on the second level of his mercantile store, he had an office. And then there was an upper room there. Well, they did temple rituals originally. Some of them were done in the Masonic Lodge there in town, but also they were done in the upper room of his mercantile store. And the little office room is infamous for where sometimes Joseph or Brigham would meet with women to try to convince them of going into plural marriage. And one of the um, exposés that came out during Joseph Smith's lifetime was of a young girl, Martha Brotherton, who, uh, a single girl, and she was invited up to the special meeting room to receive further instruction. And when she gets there, Brigham Young's trying to get her to agree to be his plural wife, and she won't agree, and so they bring in Joseph to help try to convince her this is of God. And Martha figures out real fast she better find some way to get out of the room 
And so she says, well, uh, this is a big decision. I've got to really pray about this. I'll have to go home and pray about it and give you an answer later. And then she leaves town. <laughs> and, uh, and this becomes uh, written up and published in newspapers about Martha's experience in this room. And the little office room, it, it's reported to have, have had a little sign above it, uh, something to the effect of positively no admittance. And because <laughs> that's where they would meet with these young girls. Uh, the whole polygamy thing was done behind closed doors. Joseph lied publicly about polygamy. He never once publicly admitted to it. In fact, just the, within the month before he died, he gave a sermon where he said, what a thing it is for a man to be accused of having seven wives when I can only find one. I'm the same innocent man I was when I got married. And he says these men are all liars. Well, we now know, and the church admits on their website, that he had 30 to 40 plural wives during the time that he publicly was saying he didn't. We know that 12 to 14, according to the church website, were already married. And we know that uh, at least nine of them were teenage girls. Uh, one of the problems this makes is section 132 in the Doctrine and Covenants on polygamy says if a man has 10 virgins, he's not committed adultery. Well, I don't know how you explain 12 to 14 married women. These are not women that needed someone to support them or take care of them because they were widowed or something. These were married women with husbands who already were supporting them. Uh, this has become a real problem for many Mormons on uh, faith crisis because they realize he lied. He lied to Emma, he lied to the church, he lied to the world. It was against the law in Illinois. Uh, and yet the church admits that he was marrying these married women and there's no justification for it, even by Mormon standards in section 132. It says if you have virgins, it doesn't say if you marry married women. And that's become a major problem for many people today as they do research. Well, that was far afield. Well, anyways. <laughs> I just have one more thing. I talked to a guy who was probably recently, probably about Well, I've heard of that in uh, Mormonism before the turn of the century, but not for the woman, but for uh, Satan, that he crawled on this belly in the play. But I've never heard of a woman doing it. Yeah. Well, I think somebody has confused the yeah. part of the devil crawling out on his belly when he's cursed. W.W. Phelps, I believe, is the one that did that originally. Yeah. Sandra, uh, speaking again about the old vengeance, mm -hmm. does that have anything to do with, I remember that Teddy Roosevelt banned having a flag flown on temple grounds because of something like that. Do you recall that? Mm, you're uh, outside of my scope of research. I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Erin uh, had a question. Oh, she had a question. <laughs> okay, just a um, comment and question about the temple, and then um, another question. Incidentally, one of the new changes to the new garment is that the women's garment is now sleeveless. Uh, one of the temple recommended questions in the past was, you know, I mean, you had to wear clothing to cover that. Yeah. Some women were up. Yeah. So they, they've given into the pressure um, of the women. And, yeah. You know, it's one modification. Um, a question I had, I didn't realize that the apron was to cover their sin. I was always um, learned that it was to cover their nakedness. Yes, Are which you... was because they had sinned that they realized they were naked. Right. Oh, so that was the sin? Yes, the sin was disobedience. And to cover their disobedience that they knew, uh, that they now realized they were naked, they made the covering. But God gave them a covering after that, rejected the apron when he gave them animal skin covering. Oh, okay. And my other question is, um, earlier you mentioned pre-existence. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in the Bible that 
addresses preexistence? No, I think on preexistence, you're looking at verses that talk about the foreknowledge of God on the predestination of God, knowing ahead of time who we are, what we'll do. But I don't see that as meaning that um, we earned something in a prior life that made us be born the way we were born. I don't see that kind of a concept. I don't see an existence of humans before birth. I see the Bible talks about that he formed the spirit within the womb. And I see nothing that speaks to man existing before that. In God's foreknowledge, he could give prophecy because he knew the future. And so he could see ahead of time who was going to be his rulers, his saints, his followers, his preachers, whatever. He knew that ahead of time. I don't think we had to be there for him to figure that out. 